social function etiquette. The serving of tea to friends is an old and very enjoyable custom, and so it has its traditions. These rules are not arbitrary, but have grown out of the wish of each woman to please her friends. Joan's suggestion of using a white linen cloth for the tea table is considered incorrect. A lace cloth or an embroidered cloth or one of Italian cutwork is preferable in that it is better suited to the type of occasion. A fine cloth, something that your friends can enjoy. You show your politeness by offering your guests every consideration. The cloth is spread with care so that it is smooth and hangs evenly at the sides. The centerpiece of flowers is low, and the colors harmonize with the rest of the arrangements. The same care and thoughtfulness are given to arranging the table as have been given to the issuing of invitations to the choice of dress and the preparation of the food. Joan isn't sure what type of candelabra should be used, but she is reminded that candles should not be placed on the table at all unless they are to be lighted and used as the principal light. Since this is her intention, candelabra are chosen which are not too high and which will hold enough candles to furnish sufficient light. The candelabra are then placed where they will light the table and yet not interfere with the serving. The placement is exact and symmetrical, giving a feeling of balance in the design of the arrangements. Exactness in details helps tremendously in giving the final impression of perfection. Of course, tea is not the only drink that may be served at a tea. Coffee may be offered or punch, and the service need not be of silver. Chinaware may be used. In the placing of the tea sets, the first requirement is the very practical one of putting things where they may be reached and used with ease. The rules of etiquette are, in this sense, always practical and logical. The reason behind each rule is not hard to find. You are treating others as you would want them to treat you. The poorer will have the tea urn conveniently at her right, the cream and sugar at her left. The convenience of the guest who will pour the tea is kept in mind in the placing of the cups, too. Joan isn't just sure where the cups should go, but by putting herself in the pourer's place and starting to pour, she easily finds the most logical location for the cups, at the right. The rules of etiquette are always based on practicality and consideration for others. June should not put her hand into a cup from which someone else will drink. She shouldn't stack the cups so they might topple. At the most, Cups should be stacked only too high, or better yet, not stacked at all. These are simple matters, but they avoid accidents and embarrassment. The plates are placed where a guest may readily pick one up, receive a cup of hot tea upon it, and still not have to move all around to reach the food that is offered. At the other end of the table, the plates and cups are arranged in the same way. Perhaps tea will be served at one end and coffee at the other. However, the table arrangements are the same so that the two ends balance. And in this way, the symmetry of the design is maintained. Each part of the arrangement will add its share to the total effect in making the completed table attractive. The next problem Joan is concerned with is the placing of the spoons and napkins. She wonders if there are rules as to where they should be placed and if they should be placed in any particular way, and of course the answer is yes. They should not be stacked or piled up, but be placed singly and staggered for ease in picking them up. 
The napkins that have been selected are small tea napkins which match the tablecloth. And their arrangement this way adds to the attractive appearance of the whole table. As the arrangements take shape, we see that we are being guided by two principles. One is the practical concern of serving food and drink. The other is a matter of showing consideration for our guests. On one hand, we want our guests to enjoy their sandwiches and tea without letting the serving interfere with their conversation and enjoyment of one another's company. On the other hand, we want the arrangements aesthetically pleasing as a tribute to our friends. The candles, straight and firmly fixed, will give an intimate light, a warm and friendly tone. The flowers will add their color and fragrance. The food also will be dainty, bite-sized sandwiches and cakes that are pleasing to the eye as well as to the taste. The plates of food are well filled, but not overflowing. It is a simple matter to bring another plate when one of these is emptied, or to replenish one of the small dishes of nuts or candies. And now that our table arrangement is almost complete, we may begin to check ourselves to see that everything is in readiness and in proper order. As the guests arrive and see the table, will their first impression be one of orderliness, simplicity, and good taste? Will they then notice that the arrangement is also practical and efficient, nothing omitted, such as slices of lemon for those who prefer it to cream and sugar? May we now be assured that each guest can, with the greatest of convenience and without interrupting her conversation with friends, step to the table, take up a napkin, plate, and spoon, accept a cup of tea from the pourer, chat as she moves along the table, helping herself to lemon, to the nuts or candies, then to the sandwiches or cakes. And can't we be sure that she will enjoy the flowers and the candles, appreciate a fine cloth and nice napkins, Yet through correctness in such things as proper table arrangements that we show our courtesy, good taste, and friendliness.